Self and uh, yeah. am I on now? Yeah, you are. Oh, hello. My name's Nancy, and this is my home back here. I'm homeless, and I live in Federal Way. Now, would you like to know the reason how I became homeless, Kevin and I? Kevin and I became homeless because we did drugs and alcohol. We had a real nice trailer that we lost to the dope man, and then we walked around Puyallup and uh, we slept under a bridge the first night. And we looked for uh, homeless people are always hungry because they're always walking around. So we found the armory in Puyallup. It's a real nice place where they feed homeless people. And she gave us sleeping bags and socks and gloves. And then we headed to the Puyallup River. And we built what you call a wikia. Kevin built the house out of branches and cardboard. And so I went to sleep in 20 degree weather. I was complaining. I was freezing. I was whining. And when I woke up, I was sweating to death. And I go, what is this? And Kevin goes, this is a wikia. We learned it in the Boy Scouts. So that's what we lived in on Pellet River. And then the river always overflows, so you have to leave there. It overflows right before Thanksgiving. And so then we just wandered around. We ended up in Fife, and we were homeless in Fife for a long time. Then we got kicked out of Fife, and then we came here to Federal Way. And we just keep hiding in any little piece of bush we can find. We try to stay out of the limelight of police officers. Uh, city workers don't seem to care. We've talked with city workers before, but we always avoid the police because we don't want to tell them where we live. <laughs> so we're just kind of, you know, not that we're criminals or anything. The police don't want us, but we still try to avoid them just so they don't ask us where we're living because then we'd have to lie. I'd have to think of a lie. I don't even have a lie ready. What's, what's it been like uh, the last few months? <laughs> well, the last few months have been real hard because I put down the beer can so I don't drink anymore. So on Thanksgiving Day, I'll be sober one year. Now, if you're drinking, it's not such a terrible life because you're numb half the time. I was numb on alcohol. And uh, until I sobered up, I told Kevin, I said, this is, this is not fun. <laughs> we have to go indoors. So we signed up through South Sound Mental Health. They're helping homeless people to get apartments at a, at a price they can afford. And nobody, most homeless people don't have references, you don't have a um, credit rating, you don't have anything. So you can't rent a regular apartment. And you certainly don't have deposit, first and last. So South Sound Mental Health is helping getting people off the streets. And we're on the list. We've been on the list for months, but I'm very patient. I know it'll come through. And uh, you should have to ask me questions now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so at that time that you... Uh First time on the street, or first time, you know, the, the, the trailer was taken away from you. What, what was what was that like? Uh, that's real hard. That day is terrible. I cried and cried that day. I went and sat down the Pelt River. I didn't know where to go. Kevin was working through labor ready. He said, "Meet me at labor ready at the end of the day, and we'll figure out what to do." Well, it took us a while to figure out. We're homeless. We don't have anywhere to go. We have no one to call. His family's dead. My family's dead. We're Kevin and I are each other's family, and. Uh, you walk around numb, you just numb, like we didn't know we were homeless, we didn't know anything. We walk till you get hungry and tired. And then uh, you find a hot meal somewhere, because you can find it through churches and places. And then you can finally start to think, and then we thought, well, we better get a tent. We're out here, we got to live out here, we better get a tent, get some shelter. But that's real hard the first time. When I meet a new homeless person, I don't talk to them very much, because they're in shell shock. They don't really want to talk to me. I don't know. I used to think they thought I was the law or something because they used to like run away from me. So now I don't scare them off anymore. Now I try to approach people like slowly because you're just in shock. It's like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Have you had anyone or any group of people that you've gotten close enough to to make connections that are like family connections? Uh, yeah, but the problem is... I don't want to badmouth people, but there's so many drug-addicted people, and I can't deal with them. They're so far over the edge that anything I say to them, they, they laugh. I don't think they believe me that I used to do drugs. I try to tell them, look, I did drugs too. You know, it is possible to quit. You can quit and be happy, but nobody believes me. I can tell them. I don't even tell people I quit drinking because they just... They're in their own world. They can only think about what I need today, what do I got to do, what do I got to get. And, and that's the way it is for a homeless person. It's stress all day. But when you put up a tent like this, 
some of the stress goes away because you can actually sleep somewhere where no one's going to bother you, no one's going to wake you up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, did I answer it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Max likes you guys, he's coming over. <laughs> so, um, so, so from start to finish, how long you've been without a home? Uh, ten years. Ten years. How, how has your heart and mind and soul changed in these last ten years? Well, I've changed a lot. Uh, I was always pretty stuck up. I had my own home and my own vehicles. I had my own world. And I didn't even know there was a, uh, such a thing as a homeless person. I lived in North Seattle by Green Lake. I never saw anybody flying a sign like homeless people do. I never saw any of that. So I didn't know there was homeless people. But I've changed a lot. I think I have a better heart now after going through all the hard times and being scared. Mainly, you spend a lot of time being afraid. Mm -hmm. So I think I have a better heart going through being home. Well, I'm still homeless, but I feel better about it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen God working around you or with you in the last however many years? Yes, I have. Yes, I've seen... Uh, yeah, it's hard for me to think. There's been a couple instances in my own life, but it's so hard to think right now. Because when we lived in Fife, we lived in a big pumpkin patch. It was like we had five miles worth of uh, vegetables being grown. Nobody ever came out there. And uh, we quit drugs, and Kevin Lee relapsed and went back on drugs. So I went out in the pumpkin patch, and I fell on my knees, and I prayed to God, and I cried, and I prayed. And I said, God, please help us. Get us out of this drug mess. Get us out of there. And, I don't know, Kevin turned over a leaf and it was good. But then we came to Federal Way, then he fell down again. But now he's up again. Now it's been a few months, so I'm praying that God will help Kevin to stop drugs. But Preacher Roy told me that I can't control other people. <laughs> i got to remember that. So mainly, I guess I do a lot of praying for me. And I hope it will go through to other people. What's your what's the, what's the interaction? What's the the response that you that you get from others in regards to you know those on their, driving their cars uh, by or others who have a home and what, what's their interaction when they get to they get to meet you or know you or just see you? Uh, most people I've met, I don't tell them I'm homeless right away. I usually wait and I tell them after they kind of get to know me, and then I mention it. And then when I mention it, they always go, "Oh God, you're kidding! In a tent? You're living in a tent?" I go, "Yeah." It's, they kind of act like, how could you, you know, well, how do you cook, well, how do you eat? Well, you get propane, you buy a propane stove, just like if you're going camping. It's just an extended camping trip. So I wait till they get to know me before I shock them with the homeless yeah. part of me. Because so, homeless, being homeless scares some people out. I went in a hospital one time, not St. Francis, in a different hospital, and no one could enter my room unless they were totally garbed up from their head to their toes. They had to put on slippers and everything. I thought, what do they think I have? Well, I was marked down as a homeless person. And they don't know what germs we have. Well, I would have told them if I had anything. <laughs> if they draw your blood, they can tell what you have. But that was, that's the only time I was treated weird. That was real, that was weird. But I go to St. Francis Hospital all the time. They treat me like a queen. Hmm. They do. I love that hospital. Yeah. So I have pancreatitis. I go in and out of the hospital a lot. Yeah. Because I've been cheating on my food, eating fried foods, and I'm not supposed to be. Welcome to the club. Yeah. Oh, no, you too. <laughs> we well, can you work know. on that on Tuesday. <laughs> and alcohol was a real irritant to my pancreas, they told me, so I gave that up right away. Well, no, not right away. It took them a couple of years of yelling at me before I actually saw the light. Yeah. 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 Now, describe a moment where, where you felt joy in these last 10 years? Um, probably every Christmas dinner, whatever church we go to for Christmas dinner, because when I was a little kid, Christmas was a big deal. And every Christmas dinner we go to, we've been so blessed that somebody always has a hot meal for the homeless. And I look at all the homeless people, a lot of them are my friends or their acquaintances. I know them, I know what the deal is with them, and it's just fun to see they're still living and breathing. They're still trying to make it in the world. Mm. And that's my happiest time is Christmas. Mm. And thanks to the churches putting on Christmas dinners. Mm. Mm. 
Tell me about your your experiences with the with the churches, uh, whether it be here in Federal Way or other or other places. Uh, it's always been good. If you ever walk into a church and ask for help, uh, I've never had anybody send me away. I've never had anybody say no. Uh, we've worked a lot. We met the Dream Center when we lived. Uh, we lived at Kitts Corner on 336. That's where the Dream Center used to come down with a few people, and they'd come down and meet the homeless people. Well, Thaddeus was with them, and I knew Thaddeus. He's an old timer, and I knew Thaddeus. So I figured anybody that Thaddeus is with, they got to be okay. And so that's how I met Preacher Roy, and that's how I went over to Bible Fellowship. And then we needed, we were trying to figure out for two years where we could take showers at. And that's when I met Rick, because New Hope is doing the showers for homeless people. And there's really nothing better than to feel clean when you walk. When we walk out of their church, we're clean. You have a new attitude. You feel better. <clears throat> we eat there, too, so our stomachs are full. Well, there's a couple of people I didn't know, but I figured they knew everybody else. Well, no, this one guy that I went with on a beer run to a store actually kidnapped me and dumped me in the mountains, Crystal Mountain. And that was probably my most horrible, I thought I was going to die up there. And I was up there for one week, and I found a modular home with this uh, fence around it. It was, uh, that's fencing with the razor wire on top, so I had to climb all over the razor because there's nothing up there at all. I walked around for days, so I knew I had to climb that fence. It got all cut up from the razor wire, and I had to break into that modular. Well, I had my driver's license on me, and I saw on um, Rockford Files, he always did this. Shake the knob and put your driver's license in there. So I did it from memory from watching the show, and the door opened up, and I could see it was a ranger's. It was a ranger's station, so I got in there and got on the phone. It said for emergencies call. It had this long number. I did did it, did that number, and it goes well, well, no such number. I thought, well, I couldn't even think. What will I do? Well, I'm gonna relax here a little bit. I had somewhere to sit down. They had Lipton soup. They had a microwave, so I microwave soup. Then I thought about, duh, call 911. So I called 911. They kept me on the phone for hours to find where I was, and they found me. What happened after that? After that, yeah, they drove me out of the uh, woods. Well, I call it the woods, but I'm Mount Crystal. I thought I was at Mount Rainier. They said, no, you're on Crystal Mountain. Stay there, we're coming to get you. So they took me out of the ranger's area and took me down the county and they just sent me free there. They said, well, there's our office right there. So I walked in the office and I said, hey, uh, I've been lost up in the woods. It was a total of one week I was up there. And I said, what do I do? I have no one to call and nowhere to go. What's the good? You know what the guy said to me? Well, he was a ranger, and he said, we're closing in 15 minutes. I don't care what you do. And he walked off, and I thought, okay, all right, I got to think. What am I going to do? So I walked down to Buckley, where I used to live, and I knew people there in the RV park. So that's what I did. When I was hot, I took off my socks, put my tennis shoes on, and just started walking. <laughs> then I did cuss out Enumclaw a little bit. When I went out the door, the guy did say, if you feel sick or anything, you can walk down to the hospital. Well, I didn't even know where the hospital was, and I wasn't in the mood to look for it. I thought, I may as well just start walking where I know I can find friends. So I found a friend, then they took me back where I belonged, and everybody, of course, oh, we couldn't believe he did that. Well, that guy ended up in prison, but not for what he tried to do to me. He went to prison for, it turned out, he was a child molester. So even though I didn't do any charges or anything like that, well, the police told me on the phone I might be charged with a federal offense for breaking into that modular. And I told the police, I said, well, if your daughter or if your wife was stuck out here, you'd want them to do exactly what I did, break into this place. So I didn't break anything. It's not really breaking. That Rockford Files trick worked. I can't believe it worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the nuttiest thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was probably my worst time. So now I don't trust people just by 
if there's a group of people, I don't take it for granted that we all know each other anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got my little safety thing I put up to keep myself safe. Mm -hmm. Like out in the world of a car stop. There's a guy in a car, and if it's just starting to get dark and he's stopping or something, I'm crossing the street. That's all I do. Mm -hmm. And I head for public places. Mm -hmm. That's something regular people have trouble with, too, if they walk from their apartment, you know. They don't care what age you are, I guess, in the female department. They don't care. <laughs> I'm 60 years old. Well, April, I mean, October 19th, I'll be 60. And I keep telling Kevin, I go, I can't believe the guys are trying to stop and pick me up. It's ridiculous. I'm a grandma. Might be a great-grandma by now. No, you don't look a day over 40. <laughs> 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 well, it aged me a lot, all that beer drinking, you know. It really did. I drank beer for 10 years. Yeah. That 10 years took about... 30 years off my life, I'm afraid. So, um, we talked earlier about uh, kind of church not just happening within a certain set of walls. So when you hear church, what do you, what, what do you think about? Well, you see, I was raised in a Lutheran church, so when people say church to me, I think about praying and talking to God. But meeting all the homeless people I've met, when you mention church, it's food. So a lot of it is, uh, if you don't got food, the homeless people aren't going. It's like if you want to get homeless people, you got to have food. It's, I know it sounds odd, but people are always hungry. Now, Kevin and I cook, but nobody else cooks. Jason doesn't cook, Fred doesn't cook. Most guys don't cook. Thaddeus eats out of cans. <clears throat> but I, you know, we actually try to keep our life like a partially normal, like cooking a, cooking a meal. Simple little things like that. So where do, you, where do you get the simple things? Like like the food that you have and Oh, and the food so that I have. Well, see, I went to DSHS, and you get, it's a check. It's called a GAU. I don't know what GAU stands for. But it's for depressed people. If you're too depressed to work, um, they give you $339 a month, and you get $200 in food stamps. So you can buy $200 of the food every month on that card. And then the money, that's for things you can't buy with the food card. That We buy propane. I'm a bird, I'm a bird nut, so I buy a lot of bird seed. <laughs> and there's things, habits you have, like tobacco, smoking. A lot of homeless people spend a lot of money they have on tobacco. I know we should all quit, but I'm still smoking myself. <laughs> but that's how we make it. And Kevin does studies and stuff, and Kevin gets paid for his studies. They have doctors that want to talk to you to see how your head works, and Kevin's ADHD, and he's got some autism in him. Now we're learning. These doctors are actually helping him because they're finding out what all, what all is up in that head in there. There's a lot of stuff up there, and he just happens to be in a program where they pay you for your time. If you sit there and talk with them for four hours, they pay you $50. You got a lot of fun around here. <laughs> Well, Jack, you're not going to get the cat. Jack, get down. <laughs> so, uh, what can, um, as far as communicating with, uh, with other churches, other members, the people in the community, um, what, what would you say to them about uh, how you would interact with those uh, with people, uh, whether it be there in a church? How would you encourage them to get involved uh, and, and to help? Um... I was just telling them that just their warm smiles alone makes us feel like coming back. Just the idea of being accepted by a group of people. As most homeless people, a lot of the homeless people are the black sheep of the family. Some people do have family, but they can't go to them. Other people, like Kevin and I, we don't have family. It's just their warmth, their smile, and they give you a hug. It's like, I want to come back here. You don't really have to say or do anything. talked about the churches providing food, which is a real strong point it of is. need and connection. That's one way to connect with people, is to have the food. That's true. Is there more that you think a church should be? Or is there something else they should be about doing besides food? Well, I don't know. The shower's great. Everybody loves the shower. Um, I don't know. See, I have my, I have a psych, my own psychologist now, and I go to her twice a month, 
sometimes four times a month, it depends. So see, I have someone to talk to. A lot of homeless people, they come and talk to me. And I just tell them, I say, you need to go talk to my psychologist. You need help. You need to go to the medical. A lot of them, they don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want to talk to any medical personnel at all. So the only thing we got going right now, actually, that attracts the people is the food and the showers. Uh, Roy tries to help people get their ID and stuff. Now, I just got my birth certificate. Now, maybe I can get some ID. Because you're supposed to have Washington State ID on you. I've been told by a police officer told me that. So, I know I need that. I'm trying to get it. Get it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the general uh, feeling of, of other uh, homeless people that you meet? Um, what, what are their thoughts? What, what are they thinking? Mm -hmm. Are they experiencing joy? Are they experiencing fear? Are they... Well, then do they not, have hope? Or they're not feeling joy. Uh, well, we've got a couple around here. And, uh, you know, I've got a couple of people who they have hope. A lot of the people I meet, they're hopeless. They have no hope. I try to give them hope. I try to tell them. It's not always going to be like this for us. Things are going to change. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes I just don't know what to say to people. Sometimes not about knowing what to say, but how to live together, how to be with each other. Well, yeah, well, Sometimes I'm pretty the work mean. Come they later. call me the mean one. See, there's no chairs on my where I live here because the men will sit here and drink beer. I don't let them. I don't let them do drugs in my area. I don't let them drink beer in my area. Although there's beer cans there, but Kevin, you know, Kevin drinks beer. That's the way he is. But um, no, I got rules, and people don't like my rules, so some of the guys will refer to me as a bitch. I know they have behind my back, and I don't care, because I'm going to survive this. I don't let them overtake me. There's too many. There's too many. Everybody wants help. Everybody needs a cigarette. Everybody needs a dollar. Everybody needs something. It's too much for me. For one person, you can't take it on. I go, go ask Roy for bus tickets. Bus tickets. Everybody's always looking for bus tickets. Uh, we don't know anybody that hands out bus tickets. That's one thing you always want, so sometimes I'm handing out best money. <laughs> but not everybody gets a check. Right. Not everybody gets that 339 a month. A lot of the guys have nothing. They're the ones that fly a sign. But they could get it, but they don't want to go to DSH just and ask for it. Because they're embarrassed. It's embarrassing to ask for help. I know it sounds weird, but it's true. Yeah. So what was it like, what was it like that, that first time where you did ask for help? It was real hard. It was real hard. In fact, Daddy is what got me through it because uh, when I was already here, I needed a pair of boots, and the Dream Center said, we can get you a pair of boots. Kathleen at the Dream Center said, we can get you. Daddy's goes, believe her, she can get them. I was like, I didn't want to ask her for them. So Daddy has told her for me. And then after that, Kathleen gave me a big hug. She goes, here's your boots. She goes, don't be afraid to ask. Ask me for something. Tell me what you want, and I'll help you. So the first time I didn't ask at all, I made Daddy a story. And I just sat in the background. <laughs> what is what is uh, what is hope look like for you? Well, my hope is real good because see, my hope is a lot on. Uh, well, I have a good spirit anyway, so I got my own hope inside me. But I try to keep Kevin up from him getting depressed by that we signed up for those apartments. Now it takes a long time for some people to take up to a year. But I know people like Blue Jean, she's in an apartment now, so she got her apartment, that stress starts going away. You start feeling more normal. And you're not watching it back all the time, you're not looking for a cat, you're not worried about forest fire. You're not worried about a guy down yonder got too drunk and maybe his fire's coming towards you. There are a lot of things you have to keep on your pillow. If there's fire, we all run to help to put it out because we don't want, well, we don't want to die, first of all. But I'm putting a lot of hope on that apartment because I know it'll bring Kevin back down to... He won't be so nervous. He won't have to cuddle a beer to calm down. Because he's going to wake up in an apartment. He doesn't even know because he doesn't remember. I said, you'll be in front of that TV. I probably can't even get you out of a chair, I bet. I bet I won't. But now it's all he's all stress, stress, stress. Mm -hmm. But I use beer for stress, too, because I used to stress and I... The beard numbs you, makes you feel numb, you don't worry about things. It's like, oh, okay, well, we got there another day. Mm -hmm. Let's go buy some more beer. And that's the way the day would go. Mm -hmm. 
but now I go to the library and stuff. I have my things that I do. And I just try to be in a good mood around the people who are, I call them downtrodden, the ones who are downtrodden. I just try to say one nice thing to them, like, hey, you want to come down to the library with me next time? It's real cold down there. I'll buy you a pop. They got a pop machine in there. I couldn't believe it. I thought they wouldn't want pops built on their books. <laughs> it's weird. And potato chips, too. Here. This is the front door. <laughs> Yeah, watch your footing in here. Now, as you see, my bed takes up almost the whole tent. My friend Jim Lewis gave me this bed because he bought a new one. So it pays to have friends. This is where I make my tea in the morning. This is propane with a lantern, and there's a burner right here. And I put my teapot on that burner, so I barely have to get out of bed to make my tea because you can't talk to me till I've had tea. <laughs> We keep all our food down there. It's always a mess. It always looks that way. I get tired of trying to straightening it up. This is my footstool way over here. That's where I keep my Bible and my life book. If there's something in the Bible I don't understand, I look it up in my life book and it explains it to me. And that's about it for the tent. And uh, this right here, this is the yard. cat's favorite tree. The cat climbs up there and hides on the road. There's the cat right now, right there. <laughs> That's Max. He's hiding from Jack. And, and this is just the area. We save all our aluminum. We save all aluminum. We take our garbage off the property. We go to any dumpster that we feel is safe or we won't get in any trouble at. We put our garbage in a dumpster. But aluminum is worth money, so I told everybody around here, you all save your cans. And it cuts down on the garbage. Mm -hmm. Now this is the restroom back here. It's a bucket with a board for a lid. You want to film that? Okay. <laughs> That's all this here. Now over here, now Jason don't want us to come over, he said, but can you see Jason's tarp from here? That's where Jason lives, right there. Because Jason and Kevin and Red, you walked past Red's house when you came in. Red, uh, they're all good friends, so we kind of like them being close. If there's any trouble, all the men, there's three men here that'll take care of it. Which we pray there's no trouble. <laughs> we don't cause trouble, we don't ask for trouble, we try to keep to ourselves. And there's really not anything else to look at around here. There's a bite. A bite too, Jerry. Jack is a cat. Yeah, there's our... So you're standing, you're standing next to the kitchen, yeah? Uh, yeah, we, use, we can use that burner there, but this is where they actually do the cooking. We actually cook out here because fried meat and grease and everything. We don't want the tent all ruined. Because the tent can really stay. Hamburgers in there, you smell it all week. <laughs> okay, come on here, I'll show you the baby cruiser. I thought of something I could show you. These things Shelly gave me, these came out of a dumpster. A lot of people do dumpster diving. These are bicycles that we ride. And this thing here, this weird looking thing is our baby cruiser. Now, the baby cruiser we use to haul garbage out of here. And we use it to haul water in here. It's a blessing because it really works good. Otherwise, you're carrying everything on your back, and that's too hard. And that's the trail that you came in on. Now, that house right there, that's Red's house, but Red said he didn't want to go over. And that's the tip of his house right there. happen where men are having fun drinking and all of a sudden a man will fall through a tent. I don't want my tent ruined. I don't want my tent broken down. <laughs> That's why I make rules that everybody hates. They don't really hate me too bad. But, but this is home. This is home. Yep. This is it. Yep. Yeah. Is this the 
longest you've been in a location, or? No, we've only been here, I think, two months. Yeah. We lived uh, behind, when we first came to Federal Way, we lived behind Ernie's for a year. We lived in Kitts Corner. That's the big woods across from Bible Fellowship. We lived there for five years. But then the police start coming in. You don't want to talk to a cop every single morning, or at 2 in the morning, or at 5 a.m., or at 4.30. So you just try to move along where there ain't so many people. Is there any uh, concern about living here, having to move here? Nope, I haven't. I have no reason to worry yet. No, nobody, I haven't talked to any formal person or anything. Ian and I have observed that you guys all have homes, places where you hang your hat and put your head. Yeah. You even have your own social structure. You guys deal with people who misbehave or do something bad or wrong. Yeah, we do. We do. So to think that you're non-civilized is totally wrong. Yeah, because it's true. When we hear, um, if a big mouth guy comes around that just got out of prison or whatever, and we find out he's a child molester, we'll turn him in ourselves. We don't want them around. We don't want any. We don't want. <laughs> And if children come around, I always tell Kevin the best thing to do is just turn and walk away the other way. Don't even talk to the children because then the little kids are going to go home. Daddy, I was talking to a homeless person in the woods. I told you, just turn and walk the other way. So I've trained everybody. You ignore children. You ignore teenagers. Teenagers are hard because they think they're growing up. And they'll come into your camp like this. And they always got their little marijuana pipes because that's why they come in the woods because they want to smoke marijuana. And they'll walk up to us and I'll go, hey, uh... Give me a beer, man. And I go, no. I said, you're not old enough to be smoking what you got in that pipe right there. I said, did your mom know you're over here talking to those people? Then they get all, well, we better go. Yeah, you better go. I do believe there's a fine anyway, I think, for buying alcohol or a certain thing. There's some kind of trouble. We try to avoid all trouble at all costs. So living this way within your own social structure, in your home that each of you have, you're still disconnected from mainstream society. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a, it's like a society within itself. Ethan. Ethan. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so do you miss the mainstream society around you? Yeah, I do sometimes, yeah. Um, I, do. I don't know what exactly about it it is. Like, I was up this morning, I took the bus and went to the mall to shop for Sarah, the pregnant girl. And uh, I was thinking, that it felt just like a regular person going to the mall shopping. It was like, this is, yeah, this is like what I used to do. But I do have friends here, so it's not like I'm lacking in anything. I guess when I feel sad, I go shopping. I think that's what I do. Because it makes me feel normal. I buy iced coffee, you know, two sixty-five. I don't know exactly what it costs, but I think, oh, I want to spend that too. Yeah, I do. I'm worth it. I'm gonna. It's a big treat. Eileen's the same way. Go get a coffee and go window shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it does make me feel good. I don't know why. I'm sure my psychologist could tell me. And she tells me I'm depressed, but I have a, I'm always smiling, I'm always happy. And she said my smile might be a facade, she's trying to work on me. And it might very well be, but I don't want to walk around crying every day. There's no point in it. And you get more depressed. So when I see someone who, who I would call a crybaby, that's the person I'll sit down and talk with, talk about the you know. We had a friend, Froggy, you know, he's in a wheelchair, he can't itch his own nose or anything. And we have a mate with our health. We've got two legs and two arms. That's what I tell people. If you want to cry, cry for those people. You know, that's the way I feel about it. Yeah, that's what I cry about, actually. You describe the hope that you see in getting your apartment. Yeah, that's a big hope that I'm counting on. Is because there, I know it'll happen. Is there any one thing or event that would really change who you are and how you look at the future. Is there any single thing or person that would really make your future worthwhile? 
I don't know. I was thinking when Kevin and I are doing better and have an apartment, I kind of want to be a reach out to homeless people because I know them. I know how they are. I know at first they run. They don't want to talk to you. I kind of thought of that in the back of my head. Isn't that funny? I don't think it's uh, funny. I think it's a person? natural place to be. Well, that's... that's Kevin agrees with me. So I told Kevin, I said, well, we're doing better in life. I want to come down here. I know where people live. I want to bring them candles. I want to bring them a lunch. You know? Tell them, give them hope that they can sign up for an apartment, too. A lot of them... If things don't work out, some people just give up immediately. And that's one thing that's wrong with this homeless people. We have no stick to -ism. It's hard to start something and finish it. I got four books in there with bookmarkers in I'm reading four books at one time. That is how my brain is working. I need to calm down, start one book, read it all the way through. That's the way I used to do it. But I'm still on four books at a time right now. Any other thoughts? Any other things that uh, you want to share or, or like a... Uh, at New Hope or at St. Luke's to, uh, to know about you and just the overall homeless, you know, the community here in Federal Way and how they can help. You do realize well, that St. Luke's plays a large part in making possible what happens at New Hope. Yeah, uh, you and Eileen told me. Or yeah, because there's still a lot of things I don't know. But, um, I don't know, the only hope for homeless people is the churches are the only ones paying attention. So the churches are going to be have to be the ones that are going to have to give them that uplifted, I don't know how to put it, but to get them out of their, because see, before you can be not homeless, you got to get out of that homeless thing in your head. You can't, you can't give up on everything right away. If it doesn't happen right away, be patient and wait. We're all out of patience. We have no patience at all. I know people only stand in the grocery store line. They throw their things down. I go, give me that. I'll go buy it for you. It's like, don't give up. That's all I tell people. Don't give up. But the churches are. The churches keep their doors open and feed people and say hello to people. And Even if you don't get a response from that person, that person thinks about that the whole time when they leave there. You know, like certain ones have come to your ch church intoxicated. I've talked with those certain people, and believe me, they thought about it and thought about it. No, I feel so bad. I go, Rick, I want you to feel bad. He wants you to come back sober. I can come back. You can come back. Come sober. You can get drunk afterwards. It was that important. And we've seen some make the decision to not drink at all on Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, That's. I guess that's the only thing Federal Way needs is a... Uh, a hospital to detox drinkers. 